Today on The Matt Wall Show, is our society experiencing an epidemic of mass psychosis? The regime fact checkers say no, but we'll look at the evidence today. Also, police officers in California pull a man from a crashed plane minutes before it's hit by a train. Sounds like something out of an action movie, but it happened in real life. Should we still defund the police? And for months, we were told that uh, it's dangerous misinformation to claim that the vaccine interferes with a woman's menstrual cycle. But yet again, what was once misinformation has been vindicated by the evidence. Plus, Navy boot camp will now include anti-racism training. And our daily cancellation will cancel the L.A. Times columnist who argued that it's our humanitarian duty to mock unvaccinated people when they die of COVID. We'll talk about all that much more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, it's really important that you don't, uh, as they say, put all your eggs in one basket. You have to diversify your investments, and especially now with inflation at 40-year highs. And it's here to stay because here's the dirty little secret from the government that they don't want you to know. Uh, they want it. They want the inflation. Right now, inflation rates are higher than the interest on treasury bonds. So with every day that passes, the government owes less on its mountain of debt. So you got to protect your savings now. Hedge against inflation with gold from Birch Gold. Because the government is sabotaging the value of the U.S. dollar, Birch Gold will help you convert an eligible IRA or 401k into an IRA backed by real gold. Uh, that's peace of mind. That's what you're getting. And you're also getting a great investment. That's why I am a Birch Gold customer. I encourage you to be one as well. With thousands of satisfied customers and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, you can trust Birch Gold to protect your savings. Text WALSH to 989898 to get a free info kit on holding gold in a tax-sheltered account. Then call Birch to protect your hard-earned savings. Again, that's uh, Walsh to 989898 now to get your free kit now. You know, one of the most consistent features of our age is that correct ideas are often confirmed by the people who try to debunk them. So if you want to know which ideas are not only right, but the most important and relevant to your life, all you have to do is look for the ones that the so-called experts and self-proclaimed fact-checkers are most vehemently denying. You can almost appreciate the symmetry and simplicity of it. All the things you should believe are the things they're telling you not to believe and trying to punish you for believing. And that brings us to a term that entered the public conscious a couple of weeks ago and uh, which the cultural powers that be have been trying to remove from our conscious ever since. And that is mass formation psychosis. Now, this term did not originate with Joe Rogan's interview of Dr. Robert Malone. Malone himself did not coin it, but he's probably responsible for introducing most people to the concept. During the widely listened to discussion on Rogan's podcast last week, Dr. Malone argued that COVID hysteria among the public could be an example of a kind of mass psychosis event. From basically European intellectual inquiry into what the heck happened in Germany in the 20s and 30s. You know, very intelligent, highly educated population, and they went barking mad. Um, and how did that happen? Um, the answer is mass formation psychosis. When you have a society that has become decoupled from each other and has free-floating anxiety and a sense that things don't make sense, we can't understand it, and then their attention gets focused by a leader or a series of events on one small point, just like hypnosis, they literally become hypnotized and can be led anywhere. And one of the aspects of that phenomena is the people that they identify as their leaders the ones typically that come in and say, you have this pain and I can solve it for you. I and I alone, okay, can fix this problem for you, okay? Then they will lead, they will follow that person through, it doesn't matter whether they lie to him or whatever. The data are irrelevant. And furthermore, anybody who questions that narrative is to be immediately attacked. They are the other. <clears throat> this is central to mass formation psychosis. And this is what has happened. We had all those conditions. If you remember back before 2019, everybody was complaining, the world doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we're all isolated from each other. We're all on our little tools. We're not connected socially anymore, except through social media. Um, and then this thing happened and everybody focused on it. That is how mass formation psychosis happens. And that is what's happened here. Now, as if to prove the point, shortly after the interview aired, YouTube and Twitter began removing the clips mentioning mass formation psychosis. For a time, if you search the term on Google, it returned no results. When's the last time that happened for, for anything on Google? Instead, the search would return a note from Google letting you know that it's looking for reliable sources on the subject and it will update the search results once those sources are located. 
didn't take long for the reliable sources to come along in the form of articles from mass media outlets debunking the concept. But before we get to the alleged debunking, we should note that Malone's interview was not the first time, even recently, when the subject of mass formation psychosis was broached on Joe Rogan's show. A short time before that, Dr. Peter McCullough brought up the same subject and went into to more detail describing the conditions necessary for this phenomenon to occur. We're in what's called a mass formation psychosis. This is very important. I give credit to Dr. Matthias Desmet in the University of Ghent in Belgium, and recently Dr. Mark McDonald, psychiatrist from LA. Mark McDonald's got a new book out, The United States of Fear, describing how the mass psychosis developed. What your listeners need to know is a mass psychosis is when there is a group think that develops that's so strong that it leads to something horrific. And the examples are these mass suicides that occur in these religious cults. The example is Nazi Germany, when people walk into gas chambers and were gassed, these horrific things. And, and four elements here, it's very important, Joe. First, there must be a period of prolonged isolation, lockdowns. Number two, there must be a, a, a withdrawal of things taken away from people that they used to enjoy. That's happened. Number three, there must be constant, incessant, free-floating anxiety all this news cycle, all the, the deaths and the hospitalizations, more, more variant mutant strains, everything, people could be becoming scared over and over again. And the last thing, number four, the capper. The capper is there must be a single solution offered by an entity in authority. And in this case is clear. Worldwide, the solution was vaccination. Don't listen to any of that. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It's all untrue. It's misinformation. Google found its reliable sources, which is why a search of the term will now pull up headlines like this, quote, so-called mass formation psychosis does not exist, despite what you might have heard on Joe Rogan. And, quote, an anti-vax scientist said mass formation psychosis caused people to follow COVID-19 measures. Psychologists say there's no such thing. And, quote, Joe Rogan, mass formation psychosis and why people really believe unscientific things. And, of course, fact check no evidence of pandemic mass formation psychosis, say experts speaking to Reuters. Now, those, those are the first four headlines that come up in the search results. If you take the time to read the articles in search of the apparently ample amounts of evidence that this phenomenon does not exist, here's what you'll find. On uh, the independent reports, quote, psychology experts have explained that there is no evidence whatsoever to show that a theory aired on Joe Rogan's podcast about people believing in mainstream ideas around COVID is true. J. Van Bavel, an assistant professor of psychology at uh, New York University, was among many professors of psychology and neurological science to, to debunk a concept called mass formation psychosis. Quote, to my knowledge, there's no evidence whatsoever that this concept is true, he told the Associated Press on Sunday, or rather Saturday. And then we have Reuters, they're, they're chiming in, says, mass formation psychosis is not an academic term recognized in the field of psychology, nor is there evidence of any such phenomenon occurring during the COVID-19 pandemic, multiple experts in crowd psychology have told Reuters. The phrase does not appear in the American Psychological Association Dictionary of Psychology, nor does it appear in the PsychNet database of published research articles. Numerous psychologists have also told Reuters that such a condition is not officially recognized. I've never heard of this concept. John Drury, professor of social psychology and director of research and knowledge exchange at the University of Sussex, wrote in an email to Reuters, J. Van Bavel, Associate Professor of Psychology and Neural Science at New York University said the term doesn't exist as a real academic concept. And then Business Insider confirms, quote, psychology experts told the Associated Press there's no actual support for Malone's claims. The term mass formation psychosis does not even show up in the American Psychological Association's Dictionary of Psychology. Quote, to my knowledge, there's no evidence whatsoever for this concept. J. Van Bavel, an assistant professor of psychology and neural science at New York University, told the AP. Also in the UK, John Drury. A social psychologist at the University of Sussex told the AP the idea of mass formation psychosis is similar to mob mentality or the idea that people in group in a group will lose self-control and their identities. Concepts, he said, have been discredited by decades of research. Now, note how they debunk the concept through appeals to a handful of alleged authorities and always the same authority. So all of these articles are saying that so many psychologists have said that this doesn't exist. And then they all tell us about one guy, J. Van Bavel. He really seems to get around. I have no idea who he is. He's just some assistant professor of psychology in New York. And yet this random guy is quoted as a definitive authority in literally all of Google's top search results on the subject. Some dude named John Drury earns multiple mentions as well. And of course, the American Psychological Association. They all are quite positive that mass psychosis does not exist. 
which is probably the first time that any of these people have ever shown any skepticism about any mental illness or, you know, mental phenomenon. Because it's due to the work of the American Psychological Association and guys like Jay Van Bavel that we now have millions of boys in school diagnosed as mentally ill because they get bored during math class. I mean, these people and their ilk are why huge swaths of the American public are addicted to psychotropic medication. They have medicalized and diseaseified almost every aspect of the human condition. Every personality trait, every difficult emotion, every inconvenient compulsion or behavior. And now they finally discover restraint and skepticism about a psychological concept because it was mentioned on Joe Rogan's show. This is why the experts, quote unquote, especially the alleged psychological and psychiatric experts, can be totally and absolutely dismissed. And I don't just mean about this subject. I mean, in general, I don't care what any of these people say about anything. Because most of what they do has no scientific basis. You know, they make, they make philosophical judgments about the human condition. They determine how humans are supposed to think, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to be. And then they medicalize everything that falls outside of the norms they've determined. But why should anyone care about their philosophical judgments? Who appointed them experts on the human condition? And why should we trust their appointments? These are questions that are never answered. Now, what about mass formation psychosis? We know what Google and Google's appointed mental health experts have to say, but what what is the reality? Well, we know that psychosis occurs when people lose contact with reality. That's the definition. It's an extreme disconnect from reality. That's that's what psychosis is. Um, And we know that this certainly happens on an individual level. Nobody denies that. The only question is, is it possible for it to happen on a larger scale? Can entire populations or huge portions of a population lose contact with reality all at once and in the same way? Well, the answer is obviously yes. Before we examine whether this is happening today, there's no question that it does happen. It has happened. Therefore, it can happen. You could call the phenomenon whatever you want to call it. Mass formation psychosis is just a label for it, a fine label, a little bit too medicalized for my taste, but, you know, it's fine. Whatever label you go with, it's clear that the phenomenon it describes is real. Cults. As mentioned, mass suicides, witch hunts. These are just a few obvious historical examples. Dr. McCullough identifies four conditions necessary to bring this about. One is isolation, then despair, then anxiety or fear, then an authority figure offering a solution. Again, call that whatever you want. But it is not debatable that historically these factors have come together to produce these kinds of results being described. As mentioned in the clips, Nazi Germany would seem to be an appropriate example. Now, is this what's happening with COVID? Well, just look at the results. Might we say that there's been a disconnect from reality when a mother locks her teenage son in the trunk of her car because she doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't, she doesn't want him to give her COVID? What about the people triple vaxxed who walk around outside with masks on? What about the masked woman I saw uh, a few months ago walking past us while we were, we were hiking in the mountains, in the woods. She's by herself in the woods with a mask on. Is that, not, is that not psychotic behavior? Is that not a disconnect from reality? People, people wearing masks alone in their cars. What about those who've cut themselves off from society, locked themselves in their homes for two years, isolated themselves and their children? For fear of a virus that poses almost no significant threat to the vast majority of healthy people. Is there a disconnect from reality when people push for mandated vaccines, even though the vaccines don't even stop the spread of the virus? Yes, it's exceedingly clear that the mass amounts of people have lost contact with reality. They are at this point incapable of seeing reality or being reasoned with. And their behavior, if viewed objectively, is psychotic. Everybody would have agreed prior to last year that a healthy person who wears a medical mask all day, every day, is psychotic. I mean, we would have all seen that as paranoid, OCD behavior. Many might view it differently now, but that's only further proof proof of the mass psychosis itself. 
In fact, I would take it one step further. Because I think we live in uh, an era of mass psychosis. And it didn't begin with COVID. Even if, let's pretend, China had never invented the virus and set it loose on the globe. Even if that never happened, we could still talk about mass formation psychosis. Because we would still live in a society where, for example, millions of people in the span of just a few years came to believe that men can have babies. And millions more were coerced into pretending they believe it, even if they don't. One delusional belief after another enters our culture and spreads with rapid efficiency, often infecting the younger generations first and foremost. Why is that? Well, because the internet, for one thing, is a pipeline for psychosis. It not only spreads the psychotic ideas, but but, uh, because it's addictive, it takes over people's lives. It isolates them from the real world. Everyone you see walking around with their heads buried in their phone all the time, everywhere. They don't know how to sit uh, in a chair for more than 30 seconds without looking at their phone. These are isolated people. They have isolated themselves in cyberspace, thus fulfilling one of the necessary conditions for mass psychosis. There's other kinds of isolation too, by the way. There's a very real effort um, in our culture by the powers that be, especially in the education system, the government, to isolate children from their parents, to sever their ties with their family, you know, to break down the heteronormative uh, patriarchal family structure as BLM has, has declared it wants to do. That's, that is another hallmark of cults. That's what cults do. You know, you start getting involved in a cult, and one of the first things they do is they turn you against your family. For a pretty obvious reason. They can't have you connected to anybody else. They need you to be totally invested in their world and their reality that they are constructing for you. You cannot have any contact. You can't have a foot still in any other world but their world. And, you know, given that there has been a generalized loss of meaning in our society as materialism and nihilism become the dominant philosophies of the day, the conditions of both despair and anxiety are also met. As for an authority figure offering a solution, there's no shortage of those. All of the teenage girls taking hormone pills and chopping their breasts off are relying on solutions presented to them by the authority figures they trust. And those authority figures might just be like social media influencers, but for them, that's an authority. So we are a society which has severed itself from reality and from truth, and now which floats untethered in the ether. We are preconditioned for one mass psychotic episode after another. Right now, it's COVID hysteria. Eventually, it'll be something else. There's no limit. There's no floor. We are in an intellectual and moral freefall, plunging infinitely into the abyss. So, Happy New Year. Now, let's get to our five headlines. Well, gas prices, uh, at least around my neck of the woods, are still climbing, and there's no sign of them uh, of uh, of it going in the other direction anytime soon, which is why if you have not gotten the new app GetUpside, now is your chance to do it. My listeners uh, who have uh, taken advantage of GetUpside are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. All you got to do is download the free GetUpside app. Again, it is free in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code Walsh to get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill-up, that's up to $0.50 cents cash back and uh, $0.25 cents per gallon after that. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using GetUpside. All you got to do is download the app for free and use promo code Walsh to get up to $0.50 cents a gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a month in cash back, and there's no catch. There's no red tape. The cash is added to your account. As simple as that, you can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands as well. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code Walsh to get up to 50 cents a gallon cash back on your first tank. That's code Walsh. Uh, you know, I'm going through, I got I to gotta, uh, just to mention this really briefly, so I think it's important for everybody to know. I'm going through a difficult time here at work. I don't mean to bring office drama out in the open like this, but I have to say, 
We recently changed studios. We, ju- we, we, just, we just moved to a different, uh, a different room in the building. But somehow, during that switch, I lost uh, my chair, or rather my chair was appropriated. It was stolen. My ex chair, very comfortable chair. It has heating and massage capabilities. I've talked about it before. Uh, it's nowhere to be found. I've looked everywhere for it. I've checked every desk in the building. I've asked around. And the, the worst thing is when I ask somebody, do you know where my chair is? They like they look at me like this is some kind of unimportant problem, as if they have more pressing concerns than finding my chair. I asked my producer McKenna yesterday if she knows where the chair is. She says you can ask around. But then three hours later, I don't mean to call her out, but I saw her sitting at her desk working on something else. And I still didn't have my chair. So there's a real problem with priorities, I think, around here. Here's the the point. You cannot take a man's chair from him because a man forms a special bond with his chair. It becomes part of him, especially if that man is a lazy fat ass like myself. I feel out of play. I feel disoriented now, disturbed. And I know exactly what's happening. I'll tell you exactly what's happening. Somebody took the chair and they're hiding it until the heat is off, right? Until they think the coast is clear. And then they're going to start sitting in the chair. But I'll tell you, I'm never going to forget. I will find my chair one way or another. I promise you that. Okay. What are we going to talk about first? Uh, Here's Nancy Pelosi. Here's another really important subject. She's uh, still milking this January 6th thing. And and she says that, uh, you know, there's January 6th, the, the actual event. But then there's a sort of legislative January 6th, which the Republicans are engaging in by not doing exactly what she wants them to do all the time. So let's listen. What the Republicans are doing across the country is really a a legislative continuation of what they did on January 6th, which is to undermine our democracy, uh, to uh, undermine the integrity of our elections, uh, to uh, undermine the, uh, the, the voting power, which is the essence of a democracy. I think uh, those eyebrows are basically that that's January 6th all over again. Those eyebrows are a bigger tragedy than January 6th, actually. Uh, Why? I'm going to totally put aside everything she just said, because who cares? I I don't understand why people do this. Why do, you know, especially like shallow older women, not all, not all older, but, but shallow ones like Nancy Pelosi, they seem to think that looking perpetually surprised is somehow a good substitute for looking young. Because when you do that with the fake eyebrows and the Botox and everything, that's all you accomplish. You just you look like like uh, someone just jumped out of the the closet naked right in front of you, it, it, perpetually. That's what that's always the expression on your on your face, which is not the same thing as looking younger. Here's an idea for you. Just and I and I say this to men and women, because b- both both sexes are, are guilty in different ways. When you get just look old. It's okay to look old when you're old because you are. It's, like, it's not a secret. Everybody knows that. Everyone knows that Nancy Pelosi is 152 years old. We all, we're all aware of that. So embrace it. Age with dignity. This is all part, you know, this is all, this, it's, there's many things going on here. Part of it is the, um, the, our, our still, our fear of death, our refusal to acknowledge our own mortality. And that makes it so people are somehow embarrassed to be older. And so they'll do whatever they can. They can't make themselves look young, but they can look like barely even human now. So yeah, I'll, I'll look like a, some sort of lizard creature. And that's better than looking like an old human. It's not. Just look like an old person. That's fine. That's why I don't I don't go along with this stupid thing we do in in, uh, in our culture where uh, it's embarrassed. You're not supposed to ask somebody their age. I do that all the time. I think it's an interesting fact to know about somebody. I'll say, "Hey, how old are you?" And usually, especially if my wife's with me, she'll, she'll you know elbow me. Don't, don't ask that. Why not? How's it embarrassing? So if you're let's say 72 years old, it's it's you're embarrassed that you've been on Earth for 72 years. If anything, younger people should be embarrassed. That they haven't been around that long. That they're still new around here. They're newbies. That should be the embarrassing thing. If anything, you should be lying to say that you're older than you really are. I don't get it. Anyway, uh, let's move on to this. From USA Today, officers in California saved a pilot who crashed onto uh, the railroad track seconds before a train smashed the wreckage into pieces. 
On Sunday, a Cessna 172 made an emergency landing around 2 p.m. shortly after takeoff from um, Whiteman Airport, according to the Associated Press, and then landed right on the train tracks as a train was coming. Two officers from the L.A. Uh, Police Department can be seen on body camera footage pulling the bloodied pilot to safety moments before the train collided with the aircraft. That is not an overly dramatic description. That's actually what happened. We have the footage here. Let's watch uh, this footage real quick. Okay, so you can see them. This guy's right on the plane, train tracks. Yeah, it looks like four officers there. And they're taking their lives into their hands because... And then, there you go. So I think you can count about five seconds. That is something right out of a movie right there. It's, you, you count about five seconds they had. And they could have still, you know, even clearing it after five seconds, it could have been debris that they hit them or anything. So they were taking their lives into their hands to save a complete stranger. And I think that's, it's, it's worth pointing to this video for, I think, three reasons. Number one, it's just an incredible video. Uh, number two, this is a great example of actual heroism in a culture where the term heroism, you know, heroic, courageous, all these terms are so often misused and abused and misappropriated. And uh, we use it to describe, um, uh, you know, a, a, a teacher who comes out as non-binary to her sixth grade students. That's oh, it's heroic. Now, that's creepy. This is actually what her heroism looks like. You're making a sacrifice, number one, um, and you're putting yourself in danger, in some kind of danger. It doesn't always have to be physical danger to be heroic. It could be, you know, you could be taking, uh, you know, intellectual risks or, or, you know, it could be something like that, but you're taking a real risk for the sake of someone else. That's what courage and heroism looks like. And the third reason to bring it up is um, you look at that video and you say, "Is so? Are we still defunding the police? Is that still an idea? We're going to send the social workers in to do that." When's the last time you met a social worker who would do that? A, a team of a uh, social workers, guidance counselors, therapists. I tell you what, we we defund the police and we send the uh, the squad of uh, therapists and guidance counselors in. They're going to stand off at a safe distance and counsel that guy in the plane. So that he feels better about the fact that he's about to get pancaked by a train. So they're going to provide him mental. They're going to focus on uh, on uh, you know helping him in his mental health in the five seconds before he dies. Now the reason you need cops is that you need actual people to go into these situations and do what uh, most people are not willing to do. All right, let's move to this. For months, we've been told that there's no evidence that the vaccine interferes with the uh, with the, the menstrual cycles of women or of men, because men and women both got men menstrual cycles, I'm told. At least I have to think that in order to be on Twitter. So uh, here's just an example. Here's Good Morning America. This is from several weeks ago. I don't know exactly when it's from, but they they were talking about this, this claim that the vaccines might interfere with menstrual cycles. And they said, ah, it's all misinformation. It's not true. Listen, we're going to turn now to our Dr. Jen Ashton, who has some answers to some of your more pressing medical mm -hmm. questions. We'll start with the first one, Dr. Jen. Is there a relationship between the vaccines mm -hmm. and menstrual cycles? We've definitely talked oh, about we this. We sure have, you guys. And this is really spreading like wildfire on social media with zero scientific or medical basis for this. Remember, in medicine, every time we talk about a study, a finding, what is the first thing we say? Big difference between association and causation. So yes, women can get the vaccine and then experience changes in their menstrual cycle. That does not mean that one causes the other. And in fact, if you look at the biology of how these vaccines work, there is zero hormonal interaction. So please, let's put that to rest. Yes, this got a lot of attention because a school actually in Florida was telling teachers yeah. that they used, cited this as mm -hmm. a reason for not being vaccinated. Defies science. So always good to repeat. Thank you, Doc. And another one here. By the way, I think I just found my chair. It's right over there. Oh, okay. Anyway, what, uh, so what you just heard there, it was all misinformation. There's no effect on the menstrual cycle. There's no evidence for it. That was then. This is now. New York Times, New York Times this week, a couple days ago, this is the article. Shortly after coronavirus vaccines were rolled out about a year ago, 
women started reporting erratic menstrual cycles after receiving the shots. Some said their periods were late. Others reported heavier bleeding than usual or painful bleeding. There's already some transphobia here. I mean, in this New York Times article, they're, they're saying women were reporting erratic menstrual cycles. So I'm personally offended by that, but we'll try to just go through it anyway. Some postmenopausal women who hadn't had a period in years even said that they started menstruating again. A study published on Thursday found that women's menstrual cycles did indeed change following vaccination against the coronavirus. The authors reported that women who were inoculated, inoculated had slightly longer menstrual cycles after receiving the vaccine than those who were not vaccinated. Well, there you go. Are we going to go back now and remove all of those clips online and all the articles and everything claiming that they're, that it's not true, it's misinformation? Of course not. Now, the articles that are admitting this now, they, they hasten to add that, well, it's only slight changes, it's temporary, there's no long-term harm, which might or might not be true. But the problem is, number one, how could you possibly know that? Number two, yeah, but you told us before that there was no change. And now you say, well, there's a change, but it's only slight and temporary. How do we know that uh, six months from now, it's not going to be, oh, gee, actually, some of the, sometimes it could cause long-term, lifelong problems. How do we know? You have no credibility. We can't trust anything you say. And, but we, we know why they were desperate to shut all this kind of stuff down, because I mean, if you're admitting that there are any side effects at all, that there are any potential complications, even my, let's say for the sake of argument that these are only minor complications and that the changes to menstrual cycle are temporary and, uh, and that's it. Let's, let's say that's true for the sake of argument, which, which again, we can't possibly know that right now. But even so, that, is a, that, that still qualifies as a, a complication, a side effect. And what that means is that um, now there are, when, when deciding whether or not to get the vaccine, there are actual factors you have to weigh. It's not all a fantasy. This is not all, this is not just people, QAnon conspiracy theorists who are picking things up from Facebook memes. No, totally reasonable people who are aware of the evidence and the science now have factors to weigh. And you start doing calculations if you're a woman and you say, hmm, the vaccine doesn't really stop the spread of the virus. I could still contract it. Uh, you know, I'm young and healthy. There, there's there's very, uh, very little risk to me already from the virus, especially now with the Omnicorn going around. And uh, that's mild for almost everybody. And then on the other hand, it affects my menstrual cycle. And we don't know a lot about that. And they just they just admitted to it yesterday. So who knows what else is going on? Now you got to weigh all these things. Maybe you decide to still get the vaccine, but it, it's, it would be perfectly reasonable and rational to say, hey, I, I don't know if it's worth the risk. It's just they cannot, the regime cannot admit that there's any rational thought process like that for people who are hesitant about the vaccine. The whole narrative falls apart unless they're all painted as a bunch of Wacky conspiracy theories. Meanwhile, the CEO of Pfizer uh, made some admissions himself about the vaccine. Again, this is the CEO of Pfizer. And let's listen to his anti-vax extremism. Uh, and we know that um, the, three, the two doses of the vaccine offer very limited protection, if any. The three doses with a the booster, they offer reasonable protection against hospitalization and deaths. Uh, uh, in, in, against deaths, I think, very good. Um, and uh, less protection against uh, infection. Now, we are working on a, on a new version of our vaccine, the 1.1, let me put it that way, that uh, will cover Omicron as well. And, uh, of course, uh, we are waiting to, to have the final results. The vaccine will be ready in March. Huh. Two doses is... Not enough. It's not going to do anything. Doesn't stop the spread. I mean, these are all things that by now we've heard we've heard many times. But this is the it just just it, it it cannot be emphasized enough. 
They now have the CEO of Pfizer saying things that not but three weeks ago would have got you banned from YouTube and Twitter. And maybe it still will if you're not, you know, if you're not an approved person making these exact same statements. All right, before we get to the comments, I have to, I've, I've mentioned it now in the opening twice, so I have to actually talk about it a little bit. It's from the Daily Mail. Uh, it says, training goes woke boot camp for the Navy to include classes on suicide prevention, hazing, racism, and sexual assault after numerous crises over the past number of years. So the U.S. Navy said it would expand its eight-week boot camp program to include two more weeks of classes focusing on suicide prevention, sexual assault, hazing, and racism. The change, the first major overhaul in nearly 20 years, comes as the Navy grapples with major issues aboard the ships over the years that include failures to address sexual assaults, fires, and deadly collisions, and the rise of extremism within the ranks. Um, uh, Rear Admiral Jennifer Couture, who heads the Naval Service Training Command, told the Associated Press that the two extra weeks of classes would reinforce the behavior desired in a U.S. naval officer. She said, quote, we're telling our recruits, here are all the things that we expect you to do, and here's how we expect you to behave and act. She said, adding that it involves treating people with respect and holding peers accountable. So this is Navy boot camp now, teaching about racism, <laughs> Treating people with respect. Um, the kind of thing that you would get from a, from a guidance counselor. You know, and now this is, this is what we're, we're doing in the military. You know, I, I guess I'm old school and old fashioned. And uh, I still believe, at least for me, um, as, a, as a citizen of the United States, relying on the military to protect us. The only thing I care about for people in the military is that they're very good at killing the bad guys. That is really it. At least if I were to make a list of the qualities that I would think are the most important, that's number one, two, three, four, and five. And then maybe we could list a couple of things underneath that. But that's, that's, that's the top five right there. Good at killing the bad guys. And then when you find out about the chaos aboard these ships, collisions, fires, and they're telling us themselves this is, this is happening more often now than it used to. Might that be because we are not emphasizing skill as much as we used to? Of course that's it. But their way of solving that problem is to do more of the thing that caused the problem in the first place. All right, let's get now to the comment section. You know, with all of the, uh, the the car makes and models out there, it's impossible to stock all the parts you need in a traditional chain storefront. But why endure all of that? The pointless and seemingly intimidating questions about the specifications of your vehicle only to have the person behind the counter order the parts on his computer anyway. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home. You carry it around in your pocket. Rockauto.com is a family business. They've been serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. The rockauto.com catalog is unique and very easy to navigate. You can see all the parts available for your vehicle. You can choose the brand, specifications, prices that you prefer. Best of all, prices at rockauto.com are always low for everybody. Why spend up to twice as much for the same parts and also for a worse selection? Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Go to RockAuto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. And as always, write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Misanthrope says, would Matt Walsh criticize Ted Cruz more if Cruz had called parents at a school board meeting terrorists for their conservative beliefs? We all know the answer to that question. Shame on Walsh for his lack of consistency and being weak because Knowles and Cruz probably told him to defend Cruz and not cancel the traitor. Well, you're right. Knowles uh, instructed me to defend Ted Cruz. And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Knowles, as, as you wish. But to answer your question, yes, I would criticize him a lot more if uh, he called parents at school board meetings terrorists. In fact, I would just criticize him. That's a deal breaker without even having to think about it. That's your you're, you're done as far as I'm concerned. That is that's that is irredeemable um, to call parents at school board meetings terrorists. But I don't react that way to this because the the what you mentioned calling parents at school board meetings terrorists 
That would be a far more egregious and harmful thing to say. Far more. The January 6th rioters were rioters. And they were also absolute abject morons who did something self-destructive and, and politically and personally suicidal. And now we all have to deal with the consequences of that forever as the left exploits it to no end. I said this at the time when it was happening, that these people are doing something that the rest of us are going to have to live with forever. Congratulations, guys. You were feeling angry. You were overly emotional. And you wanted to vent your frustration. Now the rest of us have to deal with it forever. Now, that doesn't make them terrorists. It just makes them rioters. And there's certainly a big difference, which is why I would never call them terrorists. And I, ob and I object to that categorization. And I object to Ted Cruz saying it. He shouldn't have said it. But they're not on the same playing field as parents who are attending school board meetings to complain about the curriculum. So, um, you know, yes, we, we don't want to go, we don't want to, to adopt the left's playbook, of course, with this and God start talking about terrorism and insurrection because that, that's just not true. It's not factually true. Terrorism has a definition. It's not that. An insurrection has a definition. It's not that. As we've discussed many times, this was not an effort to actually overthrow the U.S. government. There certainly was never any chance of that happening. And that's, that's not actually what these people were intending to do. Pretty, pretty clear because once they got in the building, they just kind of wandered around and uh, took some selfies and left. Um, so we, we can make that point. But the two things that you're, you, you're trying to, to equate, I, I find that totally absurd. All right, History and Headline says, how concerned are you that you cannot say honest statements without fear of being banned, harassed, etc.? Uh, I'm not very concerned about it, honestly. You can't worry about that. I'm just going to continue saying what is true. And uh, what happens, happens. You, know, you, you can't get to the point. You've got to be smart about it. Because I think being able to use these platforms, these platforms can be a powerful tool. So you don't want to just jump on a grenade for no reason. You, know, you don't want to, to self-immolate for no reason. Um, so you want to be a little bit smart in how you navigate these things. But if you get to the point where you abandon the truth entirely and you say, I'm not going to say the truth anymore because I'll get kicked off the platform, well, then there's no point anymore. There's no point to even having the platform. Or the only point at that point is your own, you know, just your own personal brand, your own profit. And uh, that cannot be our primary concern. LJY says, Matt, why are you still on Twitter? Disappointed you don't just give up the platform. Yeah, I really don't understand this point of view. You're certainly not the only person to say that to me. I really don't understand it. If I'm able to use the left's platform against them, why wouldn't I? Now, as I said, if it gets to a point where you simply cannot use the platform at all, um, while still speaking the truth, well, then forget about it. But as long as it's possible to use these platforms against them and to use it to get the, 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 the truth out and get the message out and to mobilize people, um, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, just one example, the, the movement at school boards, mobilizing parents at school boards. That was organized largely through social media and largely not, you know, not, not through the kind of conservative social media platforms, but through the left wing social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Now, those platforms didn't like the fact that we were using the platform in that way, but we were able to. So what's the downside? I mean, I'm, I'm all about if you want to go use alternative platforms, but, but abandoning the most powerful and visible platforms just in protest to me doesn't make any sense. Because that's what they want you to do. I can tell you, Twitter, as far as I'm concerned, not that they're sitting around worried specifically about me all the time, but, I, I, but if, if they had a choice, like they would much prefer for me not to use the platform and people like me. So am I going to give them what they want? Until they force my hand, no, I'm not going to. Um, Pig Venus, I don't know what that's supposed to mean says, thank you for not calling the guy she or her. It's ridiculous. Well, listen, pig Venus, if I ever do that, 
If I, if you ever hear me using the preferred pronouns, calling a, a, a man a she, what I want you to do is grab the nearest hammer and beat me with it until I'm dead. That's what I want. Might be a little bit extreme, but that's, at the very least, stop listening to my show. Stop taking anything I say seriously. If you ever catch, you won't ever catch me doing that. But if I do, that's like invasion of the body snatchers. My mind is gone. Abandon all hope. Okay. That's how strongly I feel about that. Uh, Tupac, Tupac Lives says, world's leading children's LGBT author. Dude, that is not funny anymore. You ran that joke into the ground real quick. Also, that book is not as hilariously clever as you think. Neither are you. First of all, it's extremely funny still, for sure. Uh, second, it's not a joke. It's, it's literally just a fact. I am quite literally, by definition, the leading LGBT author and voice in the country. I don't know what you, what you want me to tell you. That's just, that's it. And uh, finally, is Matt's background just an image? Well, let's find out. I think so. Yeah, actually it is. It's just a, it's just a screen. This is, this is like the moment in the, in the Truman Show where he runs into the horizon and finds out it's just a big giant dome. So I know it's very disheartening for a lot of you. Uh, actually, like I said, we, we changed studios. So uh, we're building a real one, I'm told. But for right now, I have a, just a screen behind me. So there are other clues as well, like that, that banjo back there. We gave that banjo away, and yet it, it appears again. So, in fact, what, what we, we went away on Christmas break, and uh, what I was told was when I get back to the studio, there's going to be a, like a brand new studio built, and it's going to be great and wonderful, and I was looking forward to it. And then I got here, you know, starting the new year, and I walk in, and uh, oh, no, it's just the old studio, but this time in the form of a sheet. So, still waiting on that real one. If you haven't heard of Jonathan Isaac yet, then you might be living under a rock. I mean, get with the time, you loser. The NBA star uh, stood strong with his values while everyone else kneeled and faced heavy criticism from, from the media for his views on social issues and vaccines over the past few years, which is why I'm very excited to announce that he's decided to write a book with the Daily Wire, uh, which is called Why I Stand. Jonathan's book will be about his rise in his basketball career, his journey into faith, and his strength of character to stand alone in the face of immense, immense pressure. Check out the teaser. The Orlando Magic's 23-year-old starting forward is deeply religious and proudly unvaccinated. On Friday, Isaac got attention for choosing not to kneel in unison with his teammates or to wear a Black Lives Matter shirt. My name is Jonathan Isaac. I play for the Orlando Magic, and I'm writing a book with The Daily Wire. Courage does not mean the absence of fear. And in today's day, there are so many things that you can be afraid of facing because of believing what you believe or deciding to stand for what you believe in. And I believe this book gives you a blueprint of my story of how Christ has made the difference in my life. From a young kid who struggled with fear, anxiety, uh, self-insecurity, to a man willing to stand for what he believes in. Jonathan's book will be one of the first under the Daily Wire's new publishing arm, DW Books, and we couldn't be happier to have him on board. The book is available for pre-order now at Amazon, so reserve your copy today. Let's get down to our daily cancellation. Sticking with the theme of mass formation psychosis, today we cancel LA Times columnist and somehow Pulitzer Prize winning writer Michael Hiltzik for this piece recently published by the Times titled Mocking anti-vaxxers' COVID deaths is ghoulish, yes, but may be necessary. Now, that title is pretty bad, but it's actually slightly an improvement over the original option. The URL for the article indicates that it was first posted with this title, Why Shouldn't We Dance on the Graves of Anti-Vaxxers? Well, anybody, anybody with a soul can immediately think of probably a dozen reasons off the top of the head why you shouldn't do that. But Hiltzik has not been burdened with a human soul, which enabled him to write this, quote, among all the ways that COVID-19 affects our lives, the pandemic confronts us with a profound moral dilemma. How should we react to the deaths of the unvaccinated? Well, again, that's not a dilemma at all for any morally decent human being. That's a dilemma in the same way that, like, should I kill and eat my neighbor is a dilemma. If you find yourself needing to pause for even a moment to consider the question, that's a bad sign for both you and your neighbor. Anyway, Hiltzik continues, 
On the one hand, a hallmark of civilized thought is the sense that every life is precious. On the other, those who have deliberately flouted sober medical advice by refusing a vaccine, known to reduce the risk of serious disease from the virus, including the risk to others, and end up in the hospital to the grave, can be viewed as receiving their just desserts. Now, need needless to say, um, though both hate speech and misinformation are ostensibly banned from Twitter, this article and its author have not been removed from the platform, even though it commits both infractions. Not only is he delighting in the death of an entire group of people, which I would call hate speech, I don't know what hate speech is if it's not that, but he's also making factually incorrect statements about the vaccine. Vaccinated and unvaccinated people both spread the virus, which means that the unvaxxed do not represent any special or unique risk to others. If they're putting anybody at risk at all, it would be, it would be themselves, which frames this entire column in an even more sinister light. Continuing, the issue of how to think about the deaths of the unvaccinated has been thrown into high relief locally by the case of Kelly Earnby, a prominent Orange County Republican and deputy district attorney who advocated against vaccine mandates and died of COVID around New Year's Day unvaccinated. So what then is the proper response to the deaths of anti-vaxxers or other determined foes of public health? First, we must acknowledge that the enemies needing to be stamped out are in misinformation, lies, and stupidity being injected into the fight against COVID. Second, we must view every one of these deaths as a teachable moment. They demonstrate in the most vivid way imaginable the folly of vaccine refusal and of flouting re re responsible public health measures. They underscore the dire consequence of turning public health into a partisan football. It may not be it may be not a little ghoulish to celebrate or exult in the deaths of vaccine opponents, and it may be proper to express sympathy and so uh, solicitude to those they leave behind. But mockery is not necessarily the wrong reaction to those who publicly mocked anti-COVID measures and encouraged others to follow suit before they perished of the disease, the dangers of which they belittled. There may be no other way to make sure that the lessons of these teachable moments are heard. So now may be a good time to show you what our friend Michael Hiltzik actually looks like. And here he is there in all his glory. As you can see, he's both fat and old. So it's rather a bold move for an elderly, obese man to mock anyone for dying, given that he's likely so near death himself. Also, as the triple chin indicates, he doesn't take his own health nearly as seriously as he pretends. Now, normally, I would say that, that his exorbitant waist and his surplus of lard and chins is none of my business. But because he's decided that other people's medical decisions are his business... It's fair to treat his medical decisions as a public matter as well. It's what he wants, apparently. Now, perhaps he would want us to mock his death, too, when it comes sooner rather than later. People who die of obesity have their own choices largely to thank for it. Can we make fun of them? What about promiscuous people who contract STDs? Say a prostitute who dies of hepatitis. What about people who die for, from alcohol or drug abuse? Is it necessary for the greater good that we dance on the graves of all these people? Now, I suppose Hiltzik would say no, that's different because the unvaccinated pose a unique danger to others. He would say that because he's a greasy, disgusting, ugly liar. In reality, as established, the data clearly proves that the unvaccinated are not special drivers of the pandemic. Everyone is spreading it. And even if they were primarily responsible for spreading the virus, still to delight in the deaths of ordinary people, Mothers and fathers who leave children and spouses behind would be twisted and evil beyond words. But to gloat over their deaths when their medical decisions had no special impact on anyone but themselves is a whole new level of deranged. It's clear in that case that you take joy in their death and suffering simply because you hate them. And you hate them not because they did anything to you, but because they refuse to comply with your wishes and your demands. They belong to the other group. You know, they behaved in ways that you found foreign and distasteful. They held opinions that you disagree with. And so you want them dead. You want their families ripped apart. You want their children to mourn them. Now, there's, there's plenty of historical precedent for this kind of bloodlust towards the outgroup. And history teaches us that it leads always and every time to extraordinary suffering and misery and violence. Hiltzik has aligned himself with, quite literally, all of the worst people of history. And he's not alone in that way of thinking, which is the scariest thing of all. And it's why he is today, finally, canceled. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. 
Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vladowski. The show is edited by Robbie Dantzler. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Today on the Ben Shapiro Show, California considers universal health care and doubling its taxes. Plus, an LA Times columnist makes the case for mocking unvaxxed Americans who die of COVID. That's today on the Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. 